the Western world and in society at large, the working woman is regarded as a symbol of independence, empowerment and ambition. The superwoman, a woman who can both balance working life and a family life, is the ideal push today. But whilst pursuing a career holds many benefits to both men and women, how is the idea of the superwoman holding up? To find out, stay tuned to Women's AM. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to another exciting show of Women's AM. You've of course tuned into a show made by women for women here on Islam Channel where we highlight current affairs, discuss topics affecting you and much more. Another very interesting topic for you sisters today inshallah. We're here live from our London studios to bring to you our viewers issues that are seldom discussed and we are joined by myself Adama and by sisters Liz and Zainab and our special guest Nazmin Akhtar. Assalamu alaikum and good morning. Well, well, alaikum salam, sis. How are you guys doing today? Alhamdulillah. Hello, very well. Ready How are to you? Shoot off? Yes, <laughs> alhamdulillah. I'm ready as always. Um, coming in this morning, I was thinking to myself that I can never, ever do without my breakfast. So I want to ask you, ladies, what is the most important meal of the day for you? I'll start with you, Sister Zainab. Um, <laughs> definitely breakfast. But in terms of what when I eat the most, it'll pro probably be lunch. That's what I aim to do, but it ends up being dinner anyway. Oh, really? <laughs> and then I just feel groggy after. But definitely breakfast. I actually really love breakfast food. I just have it all yeah. through the day. I'm a bit strange like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I could relate to that. But for me, um, I always find that lunch seems to fall off the schedule quite a lot. Mm. <laughs> so I'm big <laughs> on dinner, mom. big on breakfast, but lunch sometimes gets lost. Mm. <laughs> wow, okay then. And what about you, Sister Nathalie? For me, it has to be dinner, because breakfast and lunch, just with you, it's always, you know, you're running around, trying to get yeah. somewhere, or you miss it, or you quickly get an apple, have that. Mm. And with dinner, it's okay, you're home now, you can relax, eat with the family, so it's always dinner that's important for me. Yeah, breakfast is really important for me as well, but I never get as much time to have a really full-on, mm. nice breakfast, yeah. Yeah. because, you know, what with work and exactly. mm -hmm. rush, rush city life, and it's just, it's just crazy. But yeah, breakfast for me is definitely a must, otherwise I'm just grumpy for the rest of the day. Do you so know, for you guys. <laughs> though, the, the first thing you should have in the morning, not breakfast, not food, it should be a glass of water. Okay, why is that? Because apparently it loosens or, or prevents the kind of fat sticking to you. So it's, oh. it's very healthy to start off with a I'll glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> Either with lemon or just plain, inshallah. Great, yeah. mm. Great breakfast tip. <laughs> now let's move on to our first segment of the morning with News Bites. <laughs> In this segment, we take a look at new stories of interest from around the world. So, Sister Zainab, I'm going to start with you and see what article you've got for us today, inshallah. From uh, Huffington Post, we have uh, former anti-Islam filmmaker uh, Ar Arud Van Doorn uh, performs Hajj after becoming Muslim. This is a really, really, mashallah, extraordinary story. Um, previously, he was with the, the Freedom Party in the Netherlands. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with, with this uh, group. It's um, headed by Gert Wilders, is someone who's known for its hatred for Islam. And previously, the, the, this brother, the Reaver, he had made a, a, a film with, with Gert Wilders called uh, Fitna. And uh, Safrallah talks about Islam as uh, an evil religion um, that promotes um, violence and uh, terrorism. And now he regrets all of this. Now he's come to Islam. So through, throughout all this um, uh, uh, research into Islam, he's ended up, subhanAllah, learning more and more and actually becoming convinced by the deen and adopting it. And his, the quotes that he's given is so beautiful uh, during his time on Hajj. I felt ashamed standing in front of the Prophet's grave. I thought of the grave mistake which I had made in producing that sacrilegious film. I hope that Allah will forgive me. And, and accept my repentance. That's such a beautiful I mean. story, mashallah. And one of the things that you know struck me about this article was the fact that he actually researched into yeah. religion, and I, I find yeah. that a lot of reverts tend to do that. So it's just mm. about educating people about Islam. Definitely. Isn't it? Absolutely. You know what I thought when I was reading this story, actually, it really reminded me of Omar. 
Uh, when he took his shahada, he was actually on his way to kill the Prophet mm -hmm. and he was one of the biggest enemies of Islam and then mm -hmm. he became, you know, mashallah, one of the best Muslims. Definitely, yeah, it's important as da'wah carriers, we, we do view people as people, they're just human beings, yeah. whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim or whatever it is, it's not, there's people out there and they just hate us, yeah. it's just such a ridiculous and one-dimensional way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, you get people like this who, maybe they, their views are very extreme, but it's actually based on something they really believe in, so if you have dialogue with them, you might actually end up being able to convince them of, of another, another What's view. What's your take on this, Nazmeen, as well? Um, exactly what everyone else thinks. I think this is a very positive story to have, especially, I think, more than anything, it'll give everyone that hope that actually, even though we're having issues with Islamophobia right now, mm -hmm. with better understanding, better education, there is hope for a better future where everyone can work together and they won't have these problems. And I really do hope that, um, I know he's mentioned wanting to make another video, I do hope he actually um, goes ahead with that because it'll be interesting to see um, what he has to say now as yeah. to what he had to say before. Okay, definitely. And Liz, you've got an article for us today. Yes, I do. It's actually quite an upsetting article. Um, Facebook must now prove it's robust in protecting children after removing the beheading video, David Cameron warns. Um, so it's basically covering this, this issue about Facebook posting this um, video of a Mexican woman being beheaded um, and, and the response to that. Um, they, they have actually removed the video now, but in their defence, they've said they, they should be able to post this stuff so that people can, um, and I quote, condemn it. Mm -hmm. That's what they choose to do. Yeah. Um, again, interesting one. This I'm kind of a bit torn. On the one hand, Facebook, social media, these are public spaces. Mm -hmm. um, they're not subject to censor censorship, and I'm not sure that I think they should be. This is kind of what they're there for. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, uh, you know, it is invading people's personal space. Sometimes the space of children or mm -hmm. people that are going to be really damaged by this material and. Maybe they should be protected. I think that's the dilemma that we have today is because what with the onslaught of um, up and coming social networking sites, they have affected yeah. the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we interact. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so therefore we have these lines that are quite blurred. So yeah. We haven't really kind of defined what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Mm. What do you think about this, Ms. Mean? I think the biggest problem is, again, as you say, we don't, we haven't defined the lines yet. And whilst naturally we shouldn't, um, be so prone to be pro censorship all the time. Mm. We've got to remember that Facebook right now, even if we don't um, like a page, it'll still appear in our newsfeed one way mm. or the other. Mm. Children are on it, and there's no way of really being able to stop it from that. And mm. also, uh, what we say on Facebook is unregulated, and it should be in yeah. the sense because it is our opinions, mm. but then because it's unregulated, we don't know what's really being said, mm. um, how true it is. Mm. By the time someone comes in to correct it and say, actually, what you've said is um, an incorrect fact, mm. 100 people, 200 people have read that status already mm -hmm. and think it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, when you're trying to strike a balance is a problem. Well, I, think, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Striking a balance because I do think there's a place for this kind of material. This this is happening, so we should see it. Mm -hmm. I think about images coming out of Syria and how disturbing they yeah. are, and I think it's mm -hmm. important for us to see those images. So yeah. I don't know how I feel about this one, really. It's, it's I'm sure there's going to be one. more stories covering this, this particular yeah. issue. I'm just going to come to you, Zainab, for another story, inshallah. Yes, uh, from The Telegraph. Uh, the silent majority seeks facts and fairness over immigration. I'm s I was so glad when I found this um, article. There's so much negativity about immigration, about um, immigrants in general, that it is do doing a complete disservice to the, to the topic and to the, to the people that are involved in this. So the article explains that uh, immigration is used as a trigger to, to keep the populace alarmed and in a state of fear by all politicians. This is something that, uh, even when they try to talk about it in a positive way, yeah. it always comes across still very negative. Um, that is a critical issue for elections um, and issues like that. So we, in the news we see many stories, 300 million on uh, spent on health tourists, like people come from abroad just deliberately to use the NHS, mm -hmm. the go-home vans and things like this mm -hmm. stuff. Like <coughs> that. It's, it's really sad how this is being, how immigrants are being treated. So, you know, there's increasing harsh, um, increasingly harsher uh, legislation that's been um, put to um, immigrants but also when they um the um uh what do you call it the the their case, basically, the, the, the case that, that the government are reviewing, sometimes they, they go up to 16 years in order to, be, to have this all reviewed. Yeah. And they're kept in houses that are just vermin-infested, is yeah. one of the things I was explaining. And this is backfiring on these 
on on these um, politicians, subhanAllah, because of the, you know at the end of the day these are human beings, Absolutely. and it just makes me think of Islam. That mm. subhanAllah, well, how does Islam view travellers? How does Islam view immigrants? That like, there's so many hadiths that talk about the immigrant, uh, the immigrant, or rather the, the traveller, as someone to give sadaqa to, to be to look after. These are people who are in the weaker yeah. state of yeah. being, so they need to be mm. looked after. And also, you know, it makes me think about well, these Im uh, immigrants. A lot of them are actually invited here by yeah. the UK. If you look at, particularly from the NHS, that you know they're they're very regularly going to other countries mm. and asking people to come over because they they don't have people to fill the positions yeah, in this absolutely. country. Yeah. So that's it. You yeah, know, you can't kind of have it both ways. Um, I mean, we'll need to go on to the next story now. And shall I believe that you've got an article for us as well? Well, um, yeah, I've actually um, got another uh, another story from the Daily Mail. The fickle face of feminism. Women are fine with sexism as long as it benefits them, says a new study. Again, this is a bit of a funny story. Um, it is kind of saying it, it's identifying two types of sexism, hostile and benevolent, um, saying that women are fine uh, with, with sexism if it's including things which, uh, uh, according to this, benevolent sexism is, um, which is protecting them, looking after them, opening mm. doors, that kind of thing. Mm. I mean, I don't know, I kind of had a bit of a problem with the terminology in this mm. article. Mm. Is that sexism? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has, I was just going to say, is never sexism really sexism with just good people being good people? Yeah. And men and women could, both men and women could open a door and yeah. do it that way. Mm -hmm. And my biggest issue with this story was we don't know who the participants were and what the methodology was. Absolutely. They say, um, you know, we might be that the participants themselves um, are used to it, and, yeah. you know, used to the stereotypes of it, and they have, you know, haven't gone thought outside the box. Mm -hmm. And the methodology is looking at statements and beliefs, and one of the statements. I mean, I am paraphrasing, but it's pretty much women should be protected and cherished by men. Mm. Well, actually, I would say that as well, but that doesn't yeah. mean I'm okay with sexism. I just exactly. think because we know violence against women happens and we know that Islam is completely against it and that Islam says as well that men, men should look after women and women yeah. should look after men as well. It goes together. Believing in that statement doesn't mean I believe in sexism. Mm. No. And you know, stories like that are precisely why it becomes an issue of terminology, as you said, exactly. because you could have just, um, is it really, you know, Sexism? Could it not be another word that you could have used yeah, for it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm just going to move on to the next article now.